With the Infinity Saga come to a close, it's time to rank all the Marvel movies again, but this time we got scientific. The IGN staff all submitted their own personal rankings, and from those numbers, we calculated an aggregate ranking of the 23 movies in the Infinity Saga. So without further ado, here is the IGN staff's Infinity Saga ranking. The Incredible Hulk. Poor, poor The Incredible Hulk. Like, Marvel's never really made a bad movie, right? They've made a handful of movies that are just fine, and The Incredible Hulk is for sure in that category. It was made at the, sort of at the same time that they were making Iron Man, so they didn't really know what they had, they weren't really leaning in any particular direction, and it just kind of missed, right? We didn't really know what we had yet with the MCU. I think if it had come out later, maybe we would have liked it more, but it didn't. It was the second movie to, to show up, and frankly, the best part of it was General Ross and Tony Stark in the post credit scene. What if I told you we were putting a team together? Dead last, yeah, that, that feels right for, for poor Bruce and the Incredible Hulk. I kind of don't hate Iron Man 2. And the reason why is, consider this, Kevin Feige had this grand plan to create this massive cinematic universe. Iron Man 2 is the first MCU film that had to worry about other MCU things. We got an introduction to Black Widow, a more heavy introduction to Phil Coulson, and of course, S.H.I.E.L.D. Did it all work? No. But the movie has some great things about it. The giant race scene in Monaco was dope because we got introduced to Whiplash and an unarmed Tony Stark. The second thing that works is the Iron Man war machine back to back fighting against an army of hammer drones. Bad ass. Anyone else? Thor the Dark World. I, I get it. The Dark Elves aren't that intimidating. Malekith isn't one of the best Marvel villains that we've ever had. This is also to the time before Chris Hemsworth really came into Thor. In this one, he's funny, but he's still more serious Thor. But that doesn't mean the movie is completely awful. There are some good moments in there. I think Thor and Loki's relationship is explored in an impactful way here. There are some good things to take away from this, but again, Dark Elves, ooh, scary, and a lackluster villain put Thor the Dark World towards the bottom of the list. Age of Ultron is a Frankenstein monster story where Bruce Banner and Tony Stark create Ultron in an attempt to save the world from impending doom, which is ultimately going to be Thanos. The thing about Age of Ultron is that it kind of has a forgettable plot. Try to tell me exactly what it was that Ultron was planning to do to end the world. You can't, right? The reason people have a hard time remembering exactly what happened in Age of Ultron is because so much of the time in that movie was actually spent setting up things that would happen to trigger phase three in the MCU. But there are some really good things in this movie. It opens up with the team descending on a Hydra base. They're all moving in unison the way that they did at the end of the Avengers in the first movie, where it's like one seamless continuous shot and they're kicking all kinds of ass. The movie ultimately buckles under the weight of having to do all the setup for the MCU Phase 3. Enough! The first Thor movie actually laid a lot of groundwork for setting up a cosmic MCU. We, of course, get our first look at Asgard, and director Kenneth Branagh did his best to try and sell this incredibly theatrical, over-the-top science fiction kind of concept, yet ground it in something realistic and relatable. Loki's arc in that film really helped humanize this character and make people like him and respond to him, and really set the tone for how people would react to those characters and get invested in that relationship going forward for almost 10 years. Where the film kind of struggled, though, is all the Earthbound stuff, the very small scale of of ultimately where it ends up in this little town in New Mexico, and it just ends up a showdown with the Destroyer, and it just seems so small potatoes by the current MCU standards. That being said, it's still fun.
Doctor Strange probably would have ranked a lot higher on this list if it had come out in Phase 1, but by the time it came out in Phase 3, it just felt like an origin story we'd seen before, and really just a means to an end to get Doctor Strange into the MCU at all. I did really like what Scott Derrickson was going for with the visual element of magic, and obviously this introduced magic into the MCU, but Doctor Strange as a movie was nothing more than just a vehicle for Doctor Strange to do more interesting things. I mean, let me just put it this way. If it was on TV, I'd probably change the channel. I know Iron Man 3 was divisive among fans, but since I never read the comics, I thought the way it handled the Mandarin twist was genius, and I love Tony's odd couple banter with Harley Keener. I've always been drawn to the MCU movies that deconstruct our heroes a little bit, and Iron Man 3 was a great example of showing us why Tony Stark was so remarkable without the suit. I'll admit, the third act lets the film down a bit since that final action set piece gets too repetitive and feels a little too long, but I still find it the most entertaining of the Iron Man movies. Blasphemy, I know. Ant-Man and the Wasp is kind of a palate cleanser of a movie, right? Like, it came out right after Infinity War, all of this stuff goes down, and then we go to Ant-Man and the Wasp, which is just this super fun, kind of playful little romp that I honestly had a lot of fun with. It was great. The problem with Ant-Man and the Wasp is that it didn't really do anything in the grand context of the MCU at a time when we really needed big things to happen. Like, we were just killing time between Infinity War and Endgame at this point. So it was hard to take anything, any of the stakes in Ant-Man and the Wasp uh, too seriously. The most important thing about Ant-Man and the Wasp was the post credit scene. Guys, okay, seriously, don't joke around. Bring me up, let's go. Guys! Okay, your turn. Prove you're not a scroll. <laughs> I really enjoyed Captain Marvel because it took elements from every single comic book version of Captain Marvel and made it into this one cohesive story for Carol Danvers specifically. It's a lot of fun and you get to see this really kick-ass female lead character finally in the MCU, but I think it suffers from the fact that it's being kind of dropped right before Endgame. So we don't really care too much about herself individually, we're just seeing how important she is for the whole universe on its own. The reason it's number 14 is because it is a really interesting phase one origin story. It just happened to be placed at the end of phase three and that timing just doesn't work for it. My heart is yours. Meredith Quill. So Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 had the very unenviable task of living up to the amazing Guardians of the Galaxy. And for the most part, I think it succeeded in that. It tells this really personal story for Peter. And that's saying something after the first movie is entirely about him kind of coming to terms with his mother's death. But it's him gaining this really kind of interesting relationship with his father, Ego, this very twisted sort of dad-son relationship that builds throughout the movie, and the rest of the Guardians, who have become Peter's family, seeing this and going, hey man, you know, maybe, maybe that's not the guy. Maybe we're your real family. I do understand why it's a little lower on our list. I think a lot of people felt that it was trying to be Guardians of the Galaxy 1, but it didn't do quite as good a job. So, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, a very strong entry in the MCU regardless. I'm not surprised. It's a little bit of like a run-of-the-mill, middle ground MCU film, but I will say it is so much fun. I remember coming out of the theater and the first thing that popped in my head was just how refreshing of a take it was on a Marvel origin story. And Paul Rudd as Ant-Man is just basically perfect casting. I understand though why it's not higher on the list just because to be completely honest with you, I don't know that I can call out that many specific plot details, but I know I have a lot of fun every time I watch the movie. You have never seen this, have you? It's not for the eyes of ordinary men. Exactly. Captain America The First Avenger is unlike any movie in the MCU. I mean, obviously it's action-packed and it's got human experimentation and horror and the Red Skull, but then it's got romance, it's got history, it's about friendship, and then talk about an amazing cast. I mean, obviously we love Chris Evans. He basically is Captain America. I do understand why 
it's kind of ranked in the middle. It's a little bit long at points. It, it drags a little bit, but I, I think it's like Indiana Jones and it's, it's just a wild, fun ride. But Captain America the First Avenger is just kind of like a typical origin story. Fun, it's fun. You've got Robert Downey Jr. giving the performance of a lifetime. And Tony Stark, you've got Iron Man himself, who is a high-flying, high-tech superhero. So many laughs, super fun, compelling story. Maybe it didn't have the most compelling villain and a lot of the twists were pretty predictable, but it is a great time from top to bottom and it has that post credit scene. Nick Fury, director of S.H.I.E.L.D. How could this not start a multi-billion dollar cinematic universe that will never end? Hey, could you hold this for a second? Thanks. Hey, is this anybody's bike? This is the first time Marvel's actually respected the audience in a way that they understand you know who Spider-Man is already. And the beauty of Homecoming is how it elaborates on that by bringing the familiar, the high school drama, and couple that with the hero worship of Tony Stark. He wants to do his best to become the next big Avenger, but at the same time, he's still a kid. And another one of the strengths of the film is the villain. It's not some cartoonish supervillain who wants to take over the world. It's just a blue collar worker who's doing his best to make ends meet. And so that's a villain who's sympathetic, but dastardly in the way he kind of conducts his grand plan. It's really fun. Plus Michael Keaton, come on, it's great. You gonna be the next Iron Man now? Well, no, I don't have time. I'm too busy doing your jobs. What? Oh. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Look, keep up the good work. Because I am going on vacation. So Spider-Man Far From Home just edged out Spider-Man Homecoming on our list. It's got great action, great comedy, but more than all, it's got a lot of heart, and it really kind of is the grand culmination of Peter Parker's MCU journey thus far. It's got a great antagonist as well in J. Hall's Mysterio, who really plays on Peter's fears and weaknesses and insecurities in light of Tony Stark no longer being around to mentor Peter. Far From Home also sets up some huge challenges and obstacles for Peter as the MCU ends Phase 3 and enters into Phase 4. It's going to be really exciting and interesting to see how Peter Parker gets out of this one. Black Panther was really cool because it was an origin story without really being an origin story. We didn't necessarily need to go back to see T'Challa's childhood and how he grew up as a kid. It was just this cool eye-opening experience. Maybe the reason why it's not in the top three is because the villain is the standout character here, I think. Michael B. Jordan was so good. He was the first great Marvel villain we've had since Tom Hiddleston's Loki. And the fact that he overshadowed everybody else, especially especially T'Challa, I feel like it feels more like Michael B. Jordan's movie. And I think after the movie ended, I was just disappointed that we didn't get more Michael B. Jordan as Killmonger and that Killmonger couldn't live on to come back in a future movie. But all that said, it's still a great movie. And number eight on our list feels right for Black Panther. Captain America Civil War is so phenomenal because it does so much but never feels overstuffed, and that's including when it tosses in Spider-Man and Black Panther, who are both fantastic. The movie really fractures the Avengers for the first time in a really meaningful way, and it does that by making them question how they should be heroes. And really, the best scenes of the movie are when they're just standing around in plain clothes talking about it. This movie is number seven on the list because while it is phenomenal in a lot of ways, the plot is pretty convoluted, like Zemo's plan makes no sense, and I don't think anybody was buying Cap's romance with Agent 13, but the plot did allow for Marvel to pull off one of the most bold things they've ever done, which is still crazy looking at it in hindsight. They made Iron Man, Iron Man, the villain for Captain America in this movie, and that actually led to one of the most emotional and intense confrontations in cinematic history. I said it. Put down the spear. When Marvel's The Avengers came out, I fell in love with the MCU. I was like, how are they gonna do this? There's too many people. Like there's too many superheroes. Like this is not gonna be balanced. It's gonna be all over the place. Like I was literally expecting the worst. Like 
I had no idea how Joss Whedon was going to pull it off. And apparently he's a genius, and he did, because I felt like everybody had their moment to shine. The plot was cohesive and super fun. Loki was an exceptional villain. We saw Thanos at the end. I mean, like, it was just, like, killing it. Like, I literally walked out of that theater just completely in shock, and I was like, I need to see how this all ends. Like, I'm in this for the long haul. Infinity War falls at number five on our list, and honestly, I'm a little bit surprised because it's one of my personal favorite MCU films. I think that the stakes feel so real. Even though we knew that it was part one of two, I loved that the good guys didn't come out feeling great at it. I kind of cherish the fact that I walked out of the theater feeling so incredibly upset because it was a foreign experience for watching an MCU movie. And it was so refreshing to get a break from the Marvel formula that we know and love. So, Infinity War, love that movie. I like this one. Avengers Endgame completely belongs in the top five. Every Avenger gets a moment to shine. Everybody feels like they belong here, and this conflict couldn't have been ended without them here. It's a movie full of just tying up loose ends in really, really meaningful, impactful ways. Stuff going back to phase one. I do have to knock this movie just a little tiny bit for how they handle time travel. It is a little bit of a situation of when you start pulling that thread, things start to unravel. So just don't pull that thread. Just enjoy, wear the sweater and have fun. Avengers Endgame full of amazing moments, things that are just gonna go down in cinematic history as these moments where we all stood up and cheered. It is a movie that I think that we are gonna keep coming back to and saying this was them absolutely sticking the landing. I'm sorry about that thing with the Tesseract. I just couldn't help myself. I know. I'm a trickster. Yes, just so mischievous. Thor Ragnarok is number three on our list, but number one in my heart. I was always going to love it just for bringing Taika Waititi's humor to the MCU, but the finished product is so much more hilarious and heartfelt than I was expecting. There's an inherent ridiculousness to the Thor mythology that Ragnarok captures perfectly, but it still manages to respect its hero and lets him show off the awesome scope of his power the way none of the previous movies did. I feel like you get to see Thor's full potential as a character by seeing how he bounces off the other big personalities around him, which also paved the way for some of his best moments in Endgame and Infinity War. I'd argue that Ragnarok saved the Thor franchise and has opened up some really intriguing possibilities for the character moving forward. Plus those apps, man. We are Groot. Guardians of the Galaxy is so good because you can take it out of the MCU entirely and it still works on its own completely as a fleshed out, super fun, sci-fi movie. It came at a point in time in the MCU where we were kind of getting a lot of familiar beats and then you get this movie that starts with its hero just dancing along to a Walkman, its climax and big face down with a villain, again a dance off. Like it just had so much gumption that I could not help but being just completely enamored with it and still to this day I think it holds up really really well which is why it ranks number two on our list. Please don't make me do this. So Captain America the Winter Soldier is our number one pick for the MCU's best film. It's, I feel, the first MCU movie that really started to try to shake things up. I mean, they destroyed S.H.I.E.L.D. They showed how pervasive Hydra really was. And it was the first movie to really start to give Captain America depth as a character. It was also the first movie that really gave kind of more dimension to Black Widow. This movie really did kind of set up the way that we would come to know these characters. And I think part of that is because it was the first MCU movie directed by the Russos. It was a taut action thriller, some of those great sequences with the Winter Soldier that he was genuinely imposing scary kind of villain at first, but then you start to peel back the layers and see that he is this damaged human being. On a character level, really establishing, kind of setting the MCU up to what we would come to care about when we got to Infinity War and Endgame. None of those deaths and resurrections would have meant anything if it wasn't for all the groundwork and character work being done laid out starting with Winter Soldier. That's why Captain America the Winter Soldier is our number one pick for the MCU's best movie.
Let us know your personal ranking of the MCU's Infinity Saga in the comments. And as always, subscribe to IGN wherever you like to watch.